we talked about how damages are computed. We talked yesterday about the uh, difficulties caused by the method of payment, the lump sum, the difficulties, the advantages and disadvantages of lump sums is what we dealt with yesterday. And we saw that there had been very little change overall from lump sums. We still traditionally had two lump sums apart from interim damages which I explained to you was only relevant up until the date of trial or settlement, and provisional damages, which did allow you to come back after the date of trial once, only once, to get further compensation for the foreseeable serious deteriorations in injury. So they, that was very limited also then. So effectively, we were, had a lump sum system with pre interims and provisionals which didn't affect things very much. Today, we're going to come on to just consider structured settlements stroke periodical payment orders. These are things which have radically affected uh, serious injury compensation since the 1990s, in the last 25 years. The textbooks still haven't quite caught up with a lot of stuff that's going on in practice. And this is, as I explained to you yesterday, a particular interest of mine. It's of particular importance. Let me just explain, first of all, what a structured settlement is and how that has been overtaken by periodical payment orders. Uh, as you can see there, I, I, I wrote a book on this in 1994. Um, a structured settlement, it's an out-of-court agreement to pay damages by means of installments, not a lump sum, but periodical payments, as it were, under uh, an out-of-court agreement. And, importantly, they could be fixed for the rest of the claimant's life. No matter how uncertain that was, we could sort it out so you could be guaranteed payments for life. And how it all came about was actually, it wasn't legislation, it wasn't a court case, <laughs> it was the power of the Inland Revenue. I was fascinated to get a Law Society Gazette, as I used to get ready on my desk in those days, and a little column in one of the sort of notice columns said, the Inland Revenue have agreed that damages arising, uh, the income arising from the payment of damages for personal injury is going to be free of tax. I thought, no, that's a, they made a mistake. <laughs> that must be, that's, that's wrong. I knew that the income that you invest, when you invest money following a, a, a lump sum damages award, the income is taxed, it's investment income. You can't, uh, so, so I, I question. I questioned this, and by that very sort of peculiar happenstance of academia, this very little note in the Gazette, which had no publicity, it wasn't being covered elsewhere, it suddenly turned out the Inland Revenue had an approach made to them by particular accountants who thought they could fix something so that it would be tax-free. And the Revenue, at a high level, agreed that tort claimants should get, if they, could, if they got their money in this particular way, they could be free of tax. What tremendous powers there are in the linear revenue. Never explored, of course, in law schools, but at the higher level, it's tremendous policy decisions being made here. Wonderful stuff. So I, I got into this. And I, I came across Frankel Topping, the Manchester-based accountants, who were the, the forensic accountants, uh, and they, uh, for, for various reasons, assembled what were almost all the structured settlement cases eventually. I was very much involved in that. So, but it was started by private agreements. It wasn't started by, 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 by statute. It wasn't started by court cases. It's great what exists outside of the formal legal structure sometimes, isn't it? So this, how, well, what was happening then? How, how would you set up the financing for this? Well, there's two methods. You could self-fund as a defendant, you could, in the future, agree to pay by means of instalments. Now, wait a minute. Defendants agreeing to pay by means of instalments? Oh, can we guarantee that? Are we certain that the defendant's going to be solvent in 20, 30 years' time? No, but he's an insurance company. But you've heard of insurance companies going broke? <sighs> Don't know if we want our client to take that sort of risk. Self-funding is actually to be found almost exclusively in government bodies. The Ministry of Defence, or more particularly, the NHS. The NHS was attracted to, to, to this system of structured settlements because they were able to store up, as I've got down there, store up liability to make future payments, 
But they would save on current expenditure. They could save money this way in the short term. They were robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're not going to pay you all that big lump sum now. We're going to pay you a small amount of money on a regular basis for the next 30, 40, 50 years. It saves current expenditure. And guess what? I'll come back to this point again. The, the, the uh, Treasury, Gordon Brown's Treasury in particular, liked this idea. They liked the idea of the short-term benefit, the short-term injection of funds into the NHS. They're not going to worry about d d paying compensation 20 or 30 years down the line because Gordon Brown's no longer going to be Chancellor of the Exchequer 20 or 30 years down the line. Um, and I, I've written on, on, on the way in which we are storing up problems for the NHS by, by dealing with structured settlements in this way. But the first method is self-funding. The Ministry of Defence, similarly, and other government bodies uh, are able to take advantage of self-funding. They save cash flow. Uh, but there's another way of funding safely. There's another way in which defendants who are insured can fund this safely. Liability insurers insure the defendants, the road traffic cases, the work accident cases, and they can actually make things secure. They can guarantee the payments for 20 or 30 years down the line. Why? Because they can buy an annuity. I know, I know you don't deal with financial terms like annuity, but you should know what an annuity is. They can buy from a life office, a life insurer. Why is, why is it safer having an annuity from a life office? Life offices are much more controlled than liability offices. Life offices are offering to give you money on your death. And because of that, government and the state has arranged that they're much more financially secure. They have to have reserves. They're heavily controlled because it's easy to run away with the money otherwise as Charles Dickens and others found back in Victorian times. Starting a life office was an easy way to make quick, fraudulent money. Not anymore. Uh, um, life offices are controlled. They can be guaranteed down the line, much more certainly. They will give you an annuity, an income stream bought for, for your life. We associate that with pensions. Everybody who has a pension has a, some, some form of annuity, very often a retirement pension at any rate, for the rest of their life. Well, what's the advantages here from the claimant's point of view? Well, um, the, one I, the one I'll start with is the one at the bottom, in the sense that when I first saw this, notice in the Law Society Gazette, periodical payments can be free of tax. And I thought, oh, can't, can't, that's not true. It is true. The Inland Revenue agreed this. Unlike the income arising from the investment of lump sum, the claimants can save money here. The payments are free of tax. But wait a minute. That's not, I think, the most important factor. Um, the most important thing, I think, of all is this first one I've got up here. They can last for your lifetime, even if that lifetime is uncertain. You can go to a life office and buy an annuity on an impaired life, as they say, and the, the, the insurance office will gamble as to when you're going to die. They'll take that gamble. You might outlive them. You may, you may die early. But you can buy a guaranteed lifetime income. And that's illustrated by the case of Catherine Kelly. Catherine Kelly was the first case to get to court on structure settlements. Um, she was a 28-year-old nurse living in Manchester with her newly married husband. He was a stonemason. They took the, the ring road around Manchester on the way to work one morning and was, they were hit by a negligently driven lorry. The husband who she just married was killed. The driver of the lorry was killed as well. Um, Catherine suffered very severe injuries brain injuries and physical injuries. She was bedridden. She had limited knowledge of her surroundings. Her case was taken on her behalf by her father, therefore. Her father was an insurance salesman, in fact. He, he had connections with the insurance industry. And he, he, he was quite a, an admirable man in many ways. Um, he... Um, he wasn't interested in inheriting what could be a substantial sum of money on Catherine's death. That, that's, that's, 
He wasn't interested in that. He was concerned that she'd be cared for. Now, he couldn't care for her. She was in a home, a home in Manchester. And he wanted to be sure that there would be money to pay for it in that private care home for the rest of her life. And when it was explained to him that his daughter's life had been very severely impaired, in the claimant's side, his lawyers were saying she could last for many years yet. She could last for, for 30 or 40 years or 30 years or more. Um, the defendants were saying she'll be dead within five or six. They wanted to pay that much less. But a quite big difference between the sides on life expectancy. An irreconcilable difference between the sides. And, and you could see that if you had a lump sum, there'd be some sort of compromise. And they would meet somewhere in the middle, somewhere, sometime. And that would leave the insurance salesman father with a difficulty. That lump sum might well run out if his daughter survived beyond the projected life expectancy. And she would have to get out of that private care home into goodness knows what within the AHS. And his concern was to provide for the daughter for the rest of her life, no matter how, much, how long that should be. And it was put to him that we could use structured settlements to guarantee that she'd be kept in that, room, that, 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 that care home for the rest of her life. And although he was extremely suspicious of this at first, he thought the, interest, the insurance company would have an interest in her life. He was very worried about that. He didn't like the insurance company having any interest in her life. He nevertheless accepted, and he, he, as he put it the, it, the case was eventually overwhelming for my daughter. He didn't want the money. He didn't want the damages. He wanted the security. And the only way to do that, not via a lump sum, the only way to do that was to guarantee a payment for Catherine Kelly's life. Well, he died uh, in the early 2000s. Um, but Catherine Kelly didn't. Catherine had a pro projected life of, I think, 20 years from uh, um, 1989. So she should have died in 2009 on uh, um, agreed estimates. She didn't. She, uh, 18 months ago, she's still alive. She's still being cared for in that home and the structured settlement is still paying her care costs. Her father's wishes have indeed been met under a structured settlement. So here's a major advantage of a structured settlement that it can be linked to your lifetime. Unlike a lump sum, you can guarantee things for life because the life insurer will back it. Um, and indeed, you can index these, patient, these payments against inflation. I'll come back to that in a minute. The inflation link, they could rise with the cost, the rise in prices. I'll come back to more inflation in a minute. But there are major limitations. Um, first of all, uh, the structure must be agreed between the parties. And it was so frustrating for us back in the 1990s to find, uh, you know, as I said to you yesterday, insurers saying, oh, no, we don't do that. We, we, or even claimants, uh, um, their lawyers having affected them, their attitudes to the system being based on a lump sum, say, no, no, no we do, that's not what we want. Oh, but do you really understand what you want? Remember that what I said, talked about yesterday? So a veto from either side could destroy the structure. Um, uh, the purchase of the annuity could be expensive for an insurer. This could be adding great expense to an insurer. I admit that. Moreover, the damages still had to be calculated in the traditional way. To get to the structure, to get to the, you had to get a lump sum and then buy an annuity with that lump sum. The lump sum was calculated in the same old way. Multiplier, multiplicand. Discount rate. Discount rate of 2.5%, or back in Kathleen Kelly's case, 4.5% back in 1989. Impossible to meet that. So you're going to, you know, never, your lump sum is going to be bound to be a small sum anyway because of the problems of the, of the discount rate not really taking into account what the true rate of return was. And then you have to go from there to buy an annuity. So the presumptions, the predictions, and the uncertainty was all around the lump sum still there for a structured settlement. And you can't vary it later. If Catherine Kelly suddenly got worse and needed more care, you can't do anything about that. 
You have to keep some money out of the structure to, to, to deal for contingencies, as we did. Um, because you can't vary the payments later, as I explained yesterday to you. Provisional damages or structured settlement variations can't be done unless you foresee the specific sort of condition which leads to deterioration. You can't do that. Therefore, um, to my disappointment and campaigning, uh, structured settlements were relatively few. And you can see there, from the period up through the 1990s, there are only about 1,500 structures. Less than 10% of the NHS structures, uh, settlements, were structures. And these are over, over half a million pound ones. Half a million pound structures. Less than 10%, anything over half a million pounds, was a structure. Uh, the average sort of payment involved in a structure uh, was uh, 650,000 back in 1993. I remember that figure. So in other words, these are, these were substantial, these are substantial cases. These, these are, this is the big, this is the big, these are the big, big, big players, the big awards. And it didn't take off as much as I'd liked. You know, we were averaging, what, you know, 150, 200, 300 a year. It, it, it wasn't hitting all of them by any means. Well, um, there was an act going through Parliament in 2005. And suddenly, to, to my surprise, and even to the surprise of Frankel Topping, A new clause was stuck in to the Courts Act. The new clause had been pushed by the Treasury, it turned out. It had been pushed by the Ministry of Justice under the direction of Gordon Brown from the Treasury. This is what we want. What was it? It was for structures to be placed on a statutory footing and which would give the court the power to impose periodical payments on the parties. This was the big change. Suddenly, instead of all structures being voluntary and could be defeated by the, the veto of either party, now, now, you must consider structures. They removed the veto of the parties and they put in a new system if cases reach court, important point, where you have to consider structures. This periodical payments you know so I wrote a <laughs> campaign again I wrote more stuff and look at look at this quote the personal injury lawyer is the president who I knew quite well at that time his statement was this is the most important development ever on damages and you still will look at it. you look at your ordinary taught textbooks in your horn books your nutshells you'll see nothing about this but this is a tremendously important reform. Um, and I, I, I said to you, you know, uh, the last four, three lectures were about the computation of damages now upon the form of damages. Well, it's not quite like that. The form here is actually going to affect the amount you get because this change affects not only the level of damages, but will require a new approach to the quantification of claims, said the insurers, quite rightly. I'll explain that now. Let's go have a look at the Act. The Courts Act 2003, which came into force in 2005. Under the Act, the courts can, court can impose a periodical payment order on the parties. Even if they object, even if both of them object, the judge still can impose, and he has done before now, saying, no, you should have a periodical payment order. It's best for you. I know you don't want it, but you should have it. Indeed, the judge must consider periodical payment cases in all cases of future pecuniary loss. Now, I told you yesterday, future pecuniary loss is relatively rare. The system's awash with small claims. I, I gave you the figure yesterday, 93% of cases do not have future pecuniary loss because it's all shock and shake, 5,000 pounds, whiplash injuries. But in any case which has future pecuniary loss, any serious catastrophic injury case, the court, if it gets to court, and sometimes you have to go to court, if your client is, 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 is mentally incapable of running a case itself, it has to be approved by a judge anyway. You've got to go before a judge anyway to get approval, no matter what, how good your deal is. And the judge is then open to asking you, well, why haven't you considered structures? Why haven't you considered periodic payments orders? Have you got to consider periodic payment orders now? Um, and it can be considered for other losses as well, apart from future pecuniary loss, if the parties consent. Structures 
the periodical payment orders is the new system. Like structures, they can be linked to inflation, they can be guaranteed for the claimant's lifetime. That important financial aspect. Unlike structures, how do we take in things on from structures? Periodical payment orders, you don't have to work out the lump sum now. You don't have to use the multiplier, multiple can discount rate, even when the discount rate was so unfavorable, to work out the lump sum. Uh, um, instead, as I should explain in a moment, the, the, co the courts can index payments based upon your annual need. How much money do you need next year? Right. You'll get that, and we'll index that to increase with inflation year by year. It's at your annual needs. We don't care how much this costs in total. We don't care about what the annual sum is. <clears throat> the result is the court doesn't have to establish a lump sum value. And it's the defendant, the defendant who runs the risk, the uncertainties of what? The uncertainties of how long the claimant will live. That's for the defendant to run. That was true under a structured settlement as well. Life, life expectancy of the, of the claimant was moved away from the claimant's risk towards a life insurer's risk, or government risk if it was self-funded. But also, the way in which the lump sum was calculated under the structured settlement, under, under, under the periodical payment order, you don't have to worry about the investment risk, that requirement that you beat inflation, beat taxation, and get a discount rate above a very high percentage in the past. So in the period, certainly the, uh, from 2005 up to 2015 uh, or so, working with a you know, very difficult discount rate, you can see the advantages of a lump sum. As a, as a claimant lawyer, why should you involve yourself with a, 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 a discount rate of 2.5% when it was very difficult to achieve that discount rate over and above inflation? You'd have to get a rate of return of 6 or 7% in safe investments. Don't, don't, don't give your client that risk. Don't put him into the, into the stock exchange. You know how risky that could be if it's Black Wednesday or Black Friday or the recession of 2008. No, 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 no. Give him the safety and security of a periodical payment system, which gives the risk, transfers the risk from your client to an insurance company. So, especially with a high discount rate, you can avoid the disadvantage of the old 2.5 discount rate. Um, now, we knew the discount rate was going to change for some time. There had been a lot of inquiries. I was involved in the Ministry of Justice papers on this uh, from about 2010 onwards. And that sort of threw planning blight on, on the tort system. There were a lot of big cases, mega lump sum cases, where the, the lawyers were going, well, we, we can't settle this one now. We've got to wait and see what the Ministry of Justice is going to change. If they're going to change that discount rate in favour of claimants, if they're going to move that 2.5% down, and there were arguments for minus one, not plus two, that could, tr that could treble the damages. Christ, we can't settle that place today. We'll just hang this around for a few more years. We've got to. We can't settle. It's not for fair in our clients. But we could go to them and say, ah, but a periodical payment system will avoid that. If you go for a periodical payment order, you can, avoid, you can settle your case now. You're going to get away from the disadvantages. Now, I will say to you, since the discount rate has changed, very much in favor of claimants, what do you think has happened to periodical payment orders? Now the discount rate is down to minus 0.25. It's a discouragement to periodical payment orders. It's a, it's, a, it's a move in favor of the lump sum. Whereas the lump sum was so disadvantageous when it had a high discount rate, now the discount rate has been changed, we're moving back a little bit towards favoring the lump sum. Although all this topsy-turviness on the discount rate, all this uncertainty has created a sort of planning blight at times in, in the high-value catastrophic injury cases. They're just not setting the cases as quickly as they should be because they're trying to work out, will this change very soon? 
Now we're told this is not going to change very soon. It's going to be another three years before they look at this. So we've got rid of the planning blight. What's going to affect whether the court will make a periodical payment order? Well, how big the award is. Uh, the, the, the statute doesn't demand a set, set amount of uh, a, a, a specific sum. Indeed, uh, we did one very small settlement for, I think it was, a, it was eight or 90,000. I forgot, a very small sum of money for a very old lady who wasn't expected to live all that long anyway uh, uh, for her uh, care home costs. Um, that was the smallest I've, I've seen. Um, uh, um, but generally, we're talking about uh, seven-figure sums, a million pounds or so, uh, minimum uh, in most cases. It does depend upon the claimant's wishes, but the claimant's wishes, if he doesn't want a structure, a settlement, a periodical payment order, he may have to put up with it. But his wishes are relevant. What are the claimant's yearly needs? Well, this approach to yearly needs is said to be different. In, in, in the total lump sum system, we take a, a, um, a top-down approach. We work out what the total lump sum is, and then we, we then work out how much you can get from that on an annual basis. That's the, that's the top down from the lump sum down. Instead of that, under, under a periodical payment order, we work on the yearly need and work up. And it, it doesn't sound to be all, all that different, but I can assure you it is. The bottom up approach focuses upon the claimant's annual needs, much more specifically than the top down approach. Um, sometimes the pension may not be enough to cope for the immediate care need, in which case you give the people a lump sum. For example, if there's a large amount of contributory negligence, the damages would be reduced considerably, perhaps 40, 50%, 60% even. Um, uh, it's no point giving uh, uh, somebody uh, a, a pension in the short term which is, isn't actually going to meet his, 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 his home needs, his care needs. You might as well give him a lump sum, let him exhaust that. Uh, in the short term. So it'll depend upon what's good for the client with the cash that is available. Variation of payments. Um, uh, 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 variation of payments. What can you change these periodical payments for, for in line with what? Well, uh, uh, the periodical payment can be certainly linked to the retail prices index, the RPI as it was. Uh, to, uh, that rises with the costs in prices, with the rise in prices. But here's an important case. Ten years ago, which I was on the periphery of, the person who was really involved was Vicky Wass, professor recently retired um, to pursue her own uh, job as a court expert recently retired from the business school, lectured in this little theatre until last year. Vicky was involved in this major, major case of Thameside and Thompson's. I wrote a long article about it. What was the issue there? The issue was care costs. Care costs and the rising in prices. The, the cost of someone's care in long term in a home depends not so much on rising in prices, as the rise in earnings. The carer's earnings is the important factor. Don't tie the index to the rise in prices, because generally, um, uh, uh, earnings will exceed prices by about 2%. And with relation, to, uh, and, and Vicky had considerable expertise to look at all the labor statistics, and she was able to divide up the labor statistics to have a special section dealing with the earnings of carers. She's an absolute expert on working out these stats and finding a specific index for carers. And she showed that carers' earnings were likely to rise faster than ordinary uh, workers for various reasons. And in Thameside, <coughs> the lawyers used Vicky to argue that future wages of carers would be higher than the rise in prices. As I got down, your wages usually rise by 2% a year. But carers' wide rage, wages would rise higher than that. It didn't, actually, from after the recession for a while, between I think 2011, 14, 11, 2012, 13, 14. But actually, to this year, you can see for 2019, the wages have increased generally in the country by 3.4%. 
there's been a price increase of only 1.8. And we can generally, I think, expect wages to rise by, by about 2% more than prices each year. And you compound that over 20 years, that is a tremendous difference in damages. And in the Thompson case, the lawyers said we shouldn't be using the RPI, we shouldn't be using the Retail Prices Index. We've got another index found for us by our expert. Here it is, and it's worth to us millions of pounds. And you're going to have to pay millions more. And that succeeded. The Thompson case is a major landmark in care cases for injury, where you can vary not only according to the price index, but now according to the wage index of specific groups of people like carers. Um, what else can you vary for? Well, not a lot. Outside of those, those costs, indexes, medically, medical uh, deterioration, as we've seen, is very limited, isn't it? You can only revise for medical deterioration if it's a serious deterioration which has been specifically foreseen. Remember that? And you can only come back once. Remember all that from yesterday on the variation? So, medical, so there's still a problem if your client unexpectedly or generally deteriorates, you may need to keep back some money in a capital fund to account for that. We, we dealt with that in the Catherine Kelly case because Catherine Kelly had just bought a home with her stonemason husband before she was killed on that road in Manchester uh, uh, and she was never going to live there ever again. So we were able to sell the home for a capital sum, which was a fairly substantial reserve. So although she had a, 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 an annuity to pay for her care costs in, in, in the care home, we also had a capital sum to provide for un some uncertainties which occurred as well. And you would normally do that in a, a, a periodical payment case. You keep back some of this money in, in the form of a lump sum. You can vary uh, the periodical payment orders for other reasons. I won't go into it now. Um, but it's just very difficult to do. Um, um, if you expect, oh, shall I go into it? Um, if you've got time, uh, if you if you could be expected to be uh, uh, at the age of 18 to leave your parents, uh, to move into your own independent accommodation, uh, even as a disabled person, then, then your costs are going to increase. You're not going to be looked after in the same way by your parents as you were before. You're looking for independent living. Um, the, the costs of adapted accommodation could be considerable. So you can expect, and therefore you could plan and say, well, in, in five years' time, in, in ten years' time, you, there's going to be independent living, and therefore you could be a stepped increase in the amount of, uh, of comp compensation that should be paid. And so as long as you foresee that, you can build that in. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> the court has to, you, you still got to ex exercise clairvoyant powers. You've got to be looking into the future and making these plans. Because if you don't plan it, that's it. You don't get it. You've got to take into account what the changes could be and plan for them. Uh, I, I wrote articles on this in the past. Uh, here's a, a summary of the conclusions from uh, an article written in the Modern Law Review, actually, the leading UK law journal in 2006. It's a major reform that affects all serious injury cases. I was telling the academics, look, this is big stuff. It undermines traditional approaches to damages because it gets rid of the discount rate. Not that the many taught academics talked about discount rates all that much. Um, it, it's a bottom-up approach based on need. It's not a top-down approach, a bottom-up approach. It transfers these risks, and the investment risk, the discount risk. Um, it transfers the life expectancy risk. It can be tied to wage inflation. Look, this is big stuff. Get the grips with this. Um, um, mind you, how have, how have persons you practitioners used this law? Um, well, they haven't always pushed for a, for a, a periodical payment order. How some lawyers, smart, specialist claimant lawyers, have used this law is by saying to insurers, you know what, unless you give us more money, we're going to go for a periodical payment order. You don't like periodical payment orders, do you? You've got to keep your books open for a long time. You've got to go away and buy annuities. The annuities can be expensive. This is going to cost you, but if you, you can buy us off. You can settle this case, but we want half a million more than you're offering. We'll take the lump sum. And that's been happening. Insurers have been encouraged to pay higher lump sums to buy off the threat of a PPO. 
Um, insurers pay more. Claimants get more. These are my conclusions from the MLR. Um, government bodies, government bodies, especially the NHS, benefit by, in the sense that they save cash flow. They save in the short term. But, as I pointed out on other occasions, the NHS are storing up problems. They've got pension liabilities now, and they have to continue with those pension liabilities. And you just wonder how well the NHS are funded, don't you? That these are just going to cause long-term problems for the NHS. But the Treasury has an interest in tort damages. The Treasury affected the law of tort. Did you... Did, did, did you were you interested this week? Some of my groups weren't all that interested. <laughs> and should have been. We did employers' liability this week. We're still doing it, some of you, aren't we? Um, and I was quite keen to say, look, you know, you might, in the 2000 Act, 2013 Act, the Enterprise Liability Act, where David Cameron abolishes breach of statutory duty, look, that was a direct political response of the Conservative Party to compensation culture. That was a direct response to them wanting to get rid of red tape, to get rid of the flood of claims, which weren't happening, and false claims. There weren't many. It was a political act to please the Daily Mail. <laughs> yeah? Is taught affected by politics? Yes, it's affected by politics. We're in a law and politics department. You expect me to say that, but you try, and, you try and find out any of that analysis, even in the best textbooks, you will not find much of a law and politics analysis of, ta of taught. But I can assure you it exists. It existed for the 2013 Act. It existed in relation to the 2003 Act as well, the Courts Act. Taught is affected by political attitudes and political views and uh, uh, by politicians. So, the, yes, okay, I've droned on about it, but the study reveals the political dimension of tort reform. I actually called it the politics and economics of tort law. And the straight law schools thought, oh, it's nothing to do with us then. <laughs> um, well, what's the merits of a structure in periodical papers? So I just go over the summary of the benefits and, 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 and problems again. What's the benefits for a claimant? You, you're moving back to a, the, the pre-accident position, aren't you? You're, you're replacing a lost income with a continuing payment. It looks better than a lump sum. It's a closer return to the pre-accident position. You've got security of the lens, the life expectation risk. The one I've been emphasizing so much, life expectancy is secured. And investment security, you don't have to worry about the stock exchange. You don't have to worry about uh, um, uh, the discount rate. Uh, the, you don't have to worry about the lump sum and managing a lump sum larger than you'll ever see in the course of your lifetime otherwise. You don't, you don't have to be frightened like that anymore. We can remove that frightened attitudes of claimants. It's going to be tax-free. I mean, all students can't on this. It's not such a big deal as you think it might be. But it still is important. It's a tax-free uh, income that arises. Uh, indeed, we, we, you can actually fix this to, to enable you to get means-tested Social Security benefits. You don't actually own the fund. It's not your fund. Um, you may be benefiting from the monies, but actually it may also preserve certain Social Security benefits for you as well. I won't go into that sort of Social Security stroke tax planning, uh, but I'll just have to just take my word for it. Um, and it prevents you, prevents you being broke. Uh, you know, the capital is tied up. You can't be spent by relatives and friends. Uh, it can't be lost in risky investments or by feckless claimants. If you're broke, you're only broke for a month, as I said yesterday. What's the disadvantages for the claimant? Ah, no, there are disadvantages. If you die early, you're going to get less money, effectively. I mean, you could say to me, well, who cares, he's dead. Uh, um, well, you may want, when you're alive, to think, well, okay, if I die because of this accident, at least I'll leave a substantial amount of money for my relatives. Uh, this won't happen so much under, under a structured settlement or a periodical payment order. There'll be no windfall payments um, um, because it, insurers are taking the bet. The insurers are working out when you should die. And if they get it wrong, if you outlive the life expectancy, that costs them money. They've got to pay when you weren't expected to be alive. For that, 
they must benefit for, from early death. We can actually still protect relatives, actually, by setting up certain guarantees. You, you, you get less of a pension, you get less regular payments, but we can guarantee a minimum of payments. For example, if you've got child, children who are dependent upon you for the next 10 years in the education terms, you might want to make sure that if you die within the next five years or so, that the payments will guar be guaranteed for 10 years so your kids get the money so they get to be, go to university and so on. And that can be arranged. What are the disadvantages? Well, betting on the stock market <laughs> um, can be more profitable. It depends. It's a risky investment. It's a worrying investment, Actually, that sort of thing. Or would you rather the safety of a regular payment, which you don't have to worry about? Most people take the regular payments, but they can get lower returns than you would from uh, a very good person who got involved in the stock market. And you, you can no longer control your lump sum. And if there's unexpected increases in costs, that can be dealt with under a lump sum. It's much more difficult under a periodical payment. You've got to keep a reserve. What are the benefits for the defendant? Well, the public image of insurers, I think, could be improved here. Um, you know, instead of being seen to wash their hands of the claimant and get rid of him, um, uh, no, there's a sort of continuing care element. The insurer's still involved. The insurer's still making payments in the long term. Um, it's, it's more of a caring insurer. Maybe there's something in the public uh, image of insurers which could be improved, perhaps. I don't know. Certainly, there's a saving in cash flow for government. Certainly, uh, Gordon Brown wasn't slow in coming forward. Um, um, they, they can self-fund the payments. The Ministry of Defence and the NHS be the two biggest government bodies. They have certainly been involved in payments of large damages awards in this way. When would you consider a, st a structured settlement or a periodical payment then? Well, let me go over this again. A, when there's serious injury. B, when there's higher rate tax, because the tax saving is that much better. Of course, high rates of tax are very possible in serious injury cases because the damages awards, they can be many millions of pounds. You could be pay easily be paying the higher tax bracket. You could be easily be hit by uh, capital gains tax, for example. You can avoid those sorts of taxes. The higher the tax rate you're subject to, the, the better it is to move it into periodical payments. Uh, if you already have a lump sum, as Catherine Kelly did from the sale of her house, you don't need yet more, periodic, more, more lump sums. Periodical payments will do. Um, if your life expectancy is disputed or, or, or reduced, ah, this is, a, this is an area where you can actually bring together. So I've seen parties distantly apart. One saying you'll be dead soon, the defendant saying, and the claimant saying, no, you'll live for another 30 years. That's irreconcilable, absolutely unimaginable dif difference between the parties. And you say, don't worry about that, lad. We'll send it off to a life office. We'll get an impaired coach and we'll take it from there. And they'll take the risk of that. Oh, fantastic. Got rid of the dispute already. Amazing in, in, in bringing people together on life expectancy. Um, if long-term care is the major concern, if, the, if your client's never going to move out of those care home, you're not going to be worried about what, you know, how he would have spent money on his holidays or whatever. Um, if long-term care is the major concern, this is good. If you want to avoid the stress of investment management, this is good. If the claimant's unable to manage his affairs, then he's not going to want to gamble on the stock exchange. All those things mean structured settlements or periodical payments are especially valuable in those circumstances. I'll finish off with the criticisms. It's still only a limited reform of the system. Yeah, it's continuing inflation-proof payments for life, but you've still got forecasts of need. And they can be wrong later. You, you don't, it doesn't allow for the variations, unforeseen variations, deteriorations, unforeseen medical or economic circumstances are still difficult to deal with. Um, and structures are still tie themselves up to traditional methods, including the discount rate. So there's still problems it's still tied to the lump sum to some extent, and you still can't vary it as much as you'd like. What would a tier say? This reform affects only a small minority of tort claimants. Most claimants are small injuries, minor injuries. I don't think a tier would worry too much about them. You'd be happily not pay the small injuries, the minor injuries, the whiplash claims. Uh, um, 
but we're just dealing with a small number of tort claimants in structured settlements and periodic or payment orders. Would, you, would he spend tax money? Because it's government money that's been paid here because of the tax breaks that exist, or it's insurers' money that's been paid because of the higher cost of annuities. We're all paying for this. Would he spend the money on those who are already in the tort system? I think he'd be very worried about that. He would want some compensation to be paid to a more egalitarian system, which he doesn't discuss. He would want the money to be paid for the disabled as a whole in some shape or form, via 